Rinpoche, this is a very long question. It says, what are the risks associated with having a range of sects in Buddhism in Bhutan? What was the initial objective of creating different sects? Have we reached a stage where the objective of having various avenues for pursuing Buddhism has become counterproductive? Has this fueled a fractious pursuit of Dharma? In this regard, if the Buddha were to alive today, would he be pleased or disheartened by the state of Buddhism? Okay, good question, this one. First, do you know that Buddha was not a Buddhist? He can't be, right? Buddha is not a Buddhist. He can't be. What I'm trying to tell you is Buddhist is less important. Kansala mitun chola tan. This is what Buddha himself said. Rely on the truth, not to the person who is talking, to, talking of the truth. But of course, this is easier said than done, because the human emotion always comes. Do you know, like, um, until, I think, even way um, later, Ashoka, Buddhism never had a Buddha statue, because Buddhism value valued compassion, awareness, wisdom. Buddha himself said, I'm not a god. Don't follow me just because I said so. You know, the famous, uh, you know, saying like, um, what is it? Um, I forgot now, it's in Bali, Kepas, uh, something. Anyway, I think uh, the, loser, the loosely translated is, um, come and see, not come and join. So. I mean, Buddha, in Sekje Darvis, Sergin, the Lamar Chajir, Kuchir, there's so many, many of that. You know, like, you must analyze Buddha's words. And then, after think, knowing that this is the path you choose, only then, not because of the person, the Buddha, so on and so forth. But, Like several hundred years, only uh, several hundred years later, the human beings, you know, we human beings, we love to have symbols. And it's not so wrong to have symbols, you know? It's good to have symbols. I mean, we have things like greeting cards, earrings. Well, you know, earrings, what is it for? It doesn't do anything. Nose rings, oh my goodness. <laughs> It doesn't do anything. It doesn't make you warmer. It doesn't make you, I don't know. But these symbols, symbols are so important. You know, like the go, the blue kabne, the red kabne, the green kabne, the, all this. And we, the Buddhists, we are just a sucker of symbols. <laughs> Aren't we? We just complete. We just, we, we love it. We love it. Um, so a few hundred years later, you know, devotees have created like, um, like a, a throne and a, a deers, two deers, and a dharma chakra, dharma wheel, to symbolize Buddha taught. And then a throne with a tree behind, Bodhi tree, to symbolize Buddha's enlightenment. A very ancient Buddha statue is called Gandhara. I mean, I think we have some, you know, in our museum, you know, Gandhara, which present day is Kandahar, where everything is, you know, being stirred at the moment. But anyway, uh, then came the, you know, Buddha statues. I'm, I'm trying to answer this, by the way. So what I'm saying is the human, human beings love these complications of Buddha statues. And then, of course, it got more and more complicated with the Buddha statues, standing, sitting, without books, without the books, with, you know, and then in the green, the blue, the, and then, of course, as it goes down, and then the different schools and the sects, a yellow hat, red hat, black hat, all kinds of hats, 
stuff like this image. And they all served a certain purpose. They all served a certain purpose. I mean, even in Bhutan, you have so, you know, I, uh, you know, there's so many like uh, groups, you know, the, you know, like uh, religious groups and stuff like that. You know, we, we, we love clubbing, basically. We like to be, <laughs> we like, we like, we love belonging to some kind of a club. And the uniform, of course, of course, the uniform. Have you noticed that? The, you know, all this, you know, the, the chops or something, you know, they all, you know, oh, you know, he must be so and so Rinpoche's disciple. Why? Oh, he's, you know, this is how he, he wears the robes, different robes, and human mind, inevitable. Never really found in the Shastras and Sutras, it's all this. But I am not rejecting this entirely. They do serve a certain purpose. It brings them, it's a bit like, I think I've told you this before also, it's a bit like if, you, if I need to show you the moon, I have to use my finger, look. But you are supposed to not look at my finger. You are supposed to look at the moon. <laughs> but because my hand is so attractive, <laughs> you know, it's like painted, it's gold, it's silver. So you end up looking at, the, at my finger. And this happens a lot. I don't have a solution for that, but this, I'm ju just telling you this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> How do you reconcile the phenomenon of reincarnation and continuity with the fundamental Buddhist principle of impermanence? Oh, the question, the one who is asking this uh, kind of seemed to uh, insinuate that the reincarnation and the impermanence are contradiction, but they are not. Actually, reincarnation is a very aspect of the impermanence. But the reincarnation is a big subject Reincarnation, by the way, again, I'll try to uh, abbreviate this very. Uh, reincarnation, in order to understand the reincarnation, you have to understand, you have to appreciate law of time. Do you believe in time? Well, might as well believe in reincarnation. As a Buddhist, if you ask me, do I believe in reincarnation and time? Ultimately, no. Relatively, yes. A scientist who kind of raised their eyebrow, oh, what about this reincarnation, this, you know, this Buddhist reincarnation stuff, but who just blindly says, oh, see you tomorrow. I was there yesterday. It's stupid. Reincarnation is stupid. Time is stupid. That's why they are relative. But stupid does not mean that they are useless. Many stupid things are useful. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, because there's so many questions I'm trying to answer all. So we have to make it very short. Some of the answers may be a little bit cryptic, but... Uh, Rinpoche, this is also a very long question. Is the procedure that monks are subjugated, subjected to from an early age inappropriate when considering the fact that Buddha only abdicated his normal life in pursuit of the truth when he turned 26? A monk from the age of five hardly understands the complexities of so societal norms and relationships. Shouldn't people be encouraged to pursue the truth only after realizing these sufferings? I will tend to argue and uh, agree with this person, actually. Yeah. I've been asked by many, um, not many, actually not many, uh, because people are a little bit wary of me, but some, bra you know, some mindless people too, you know, and mon monasteries, they, they, they've been asking me to look after their tulkus, you know, like uh, Rinpoche's young Rinpoche's, and my thing is, you know, they should work in McDonald's, they should fall in love, <laughs> and 
and they should be rejected by this rejected by this lover just bitterly <laughs> and then only then they will know the first noble truth the truth of suffering <laughs> so i tend to agree this a little bit uh, another very long question la as a buddhist practitioner where do you see our central monastic body in bhutan heading towards 30 to 50 years from now this question is in context of dwindling numbers of monks from our monastic schools for various reasons much of which are attributable to the transformation of a society with modernity and socio-economic development. Should the monks gradually disappear from our monastic institutions, how do we manage to practice our rituals and Buddhist tra traditional practices? This is such an important question, actually. Not just to answer you, but to ask among us lamas, and maybe the Tratsangs, and anyone who has a monastery or the monastic situation. I mean, more than answering you, this is something that we have to really think about it. But you know, I've always thought of this. When American forefathers, when they designed New York City, and when they left this big you know, a chunk of land called uh, Central Park. I mean, like 200 years ago, almost 200 years ago, right? I'm sure there has been so many voices and what? What a waste of land. Why not build houses? You know what I mean? It's big, big, it's, it's a really big Central Park, New York. But the American forefathers saw, they, they, they're visionary. They can see where it's going. And also the size of their road, avenues, streets. It's very big, 200, if you think about 200 years ago, it's very big. I'm sure there's only like a few horse carts going up and down. But it worked. Now it's just making it, you know? So you, you need this kind of visionary. I'm not claiming that I'm visionary. I try to sort of, you know, it's a very big gamble, you know, it's a very big gamble. I don't know about all the other monasteries. I have been myself, I have few monasteries, one in India, one in uh, Sichuan in China, uh, kind of two in Bhutan. I have been sort of telling them, hey, look, you know, one of these days, we should really think about admitting uh, girls. We should really change the curriculum of their study. We should really, you know, um, introduce, you know, like um, uh, edu uh, different kinds of education. I, I'm not necessarily, um, uh, I know, Bemtini, uh, I saw him here somewhere, somewhere, where was it? Yeah, I know. Uh, you are here, but I'm not a big, big fan of the, uh, you know, education system that has, uh, that is existing today in this world. Actually, I am not. I mean, actually, I've been researching. Do you know that some of the most successful people in the world are all school dropouts? Well, they've never really finished schooling, like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and also in Bhutan, I'm not going to mention the names. <laughs> also in Bhutan, many of the well-to-do successful people, they, they, you know, they're barely able to write their own names, right? So, you know, but nevertheless, you know, I, I have this, you know, I have been sort of opening my mouth and telling a few of these monasteries that we should really um, you know, think, uh, you know, dramatically and change it drastically. But you know, <coughs> you are talking to devotees. You are talking to people who are sort of so stuck with a certain ethic and morality and certain value. It's tough. It's really, really tough. Yes, I will tell you bravely, I can see uh, 
for instance, our zongs, like Timbu zong, Baro zong, Jatsangs. Yes. Judging from what is happening, 50 years from now on, probably there will be only 50 monks. Yes. This is something that we, the Lamas, Rinpoches, Jatsangs, we have to think about it. We really have to. Um, having said that, there's a lot of encouraging sign also. Like Prince Siddhartha, I mean, in a smaller scale, there are a lot of young people, even, in but even the Bhutanis. I, I mean, I have myself met uh, some in San Francisco, uh, some in Seattle, who are sent by the government or their parents with so much money, tuition, all of that, and they're there. And they're kind of, you know, like, Rinpoche, I really want to become a monk, but you know, my parents have spent all this money. I feel guilty, you know, like, you know, I really don't want to go back to, you know, like business. I don't, I did such a good sign. Wow, what a encouraging for the spiritual world, I thought. And this is also happening. And this is something that we should, I think, uh, bank on. I feel, I personally feel. Really, some young Bhutanese, huh? So amazing. I would have thought, you know, Bhutanese, all they want to do is get the best education, become the best lawyer or whatever, and then get a lot of, uh, a best job, make lots of money, the best, uh, buy the best car. But these young people, they really shocked me. Wow, you know, they really wanted to, they can see, they see the world in a different way. And these people are educated, these people have brain, they are, they are a thinker. It really surprised me. Bhutan being a Buddhist country, we have banned tobacco. Since, so is tobacco sin in Buddhist religion and did Bhutan take the right decision? I'm always so puzzled. Why ban tobacco? Why not alcohol also? <laughs> I mean, they, they're both destructive. In Buddhism, many, when I travel, many of my monks, for instance, when they go to like uh, Thailand, you, you know sometimes you see the monks smoking, and then you know like my attendants, my fellow Buddhists, they say, oh, look, they're so bad Buddhists, you know, they're smoking. <laughs> but I always have to tell them, hey, look, in the, you know, the monk, as a monk, you have this Vinaya. In the whole Vinaya chapters, there's not even one word that mentions you should not smoke. There you go. Then, I'll tell you, take by chela shalaka. As a Mahayana Buddhist, we should not be eating meat. Do you know that? We really should not be. In the Lanka Avatara Sutra, in the Vimalakriti Sutra, in many, many, many of the great Mahayana Sutras, meat is no, 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 no. But because we, Pakshapa and all of that, you know, how can we get rid of that? <laughs> Isn't it? But then that we sort of close one eye. <laughs> Isn't it? So, but I will have to say, I will still advocate banning the tobacco just for the healthy reason probably, but then in that case, even the alcohol is very dodgy. <laughs> so, I don't know, I'm a little bit, um, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, diplomatic here, I have no reason. Um, I'm no, I don't have a friend who's, who owns tobacco company here. <laughs> But um, um, my personal, my personally, I just don't want Buddhism to become a culture or a ritual. As a Buddhist and as a Rinpoche, who is supposedly caretaker of the Buddhism, I'm, one of my biggest fear is that Buddhism in Bhutan will end up becoming a ritual or a culture, 
or some kind of a narrow code of conduct. That is, if you do that, you are really, really, uh, what do you call it? You are, you think you are servicing Buddhism, you are offering a service to Buddhism, but in fact you are doing the opposite. Because Buddhism is much, 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 much grander than no tobacco, no alcohol, no meat, you know. Buddhism is, Buddhism is science, Buddhism is life, Buddhism is the study of life, Buddhism is study of yourself, Buddhism is study of illusion. So it should not be hijacked by some narrow issues like, oh, you know, tobacco, and you, you, you should not be. And because What will happen if somebody says, oh, you must be a good Buddhist because you don't smoke? So dangerous. <laughs> That's so dangerous. Because many, many non-smokers are the most dangerous people. <laughs> okay. But please don't smoke. <laughs> From my heart, I'm telling you, for your lung and all of that, you know, tea. <laughs>